web of leaves of absences. Today, uh, we're going to be covering a very complex topic, and I want to welcome all of you for joining us today. My name is Julie Dorr, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation will last approximately 40 minutes, with the remaining time available for your questions. We do have an information-packed session today, so hopefully we will have time at the end for those questions. Earlier this morning, we emailed you a link to a copy of the presentation we have here today. Hopefully you received it and you were able to download it prior to this uh, webinar. If not, my email address is right here on the screen. It's julie at enlightenbiz.com. You can email me right away and I'll be happy to send you a PDF of that document right away. Before we get started, please note that this webinar and all the accompanying materials are protected by copyright and that the entire conference is being recorded. This presentation provides general information only and really does not constitute any legal advice and shouldn't be interpreted that way. We recommend that you consult with legal counsel to address your specific situation. So let's get started today, and I'm very happy to announce, and Marlo will certainly fill in any details that I happen to miss, um, we've got our first expert speaker. It's Marlo Murab Robinson with the newly named law firm Mirab Robinson, Jackson, and Clarkson. Um, just so you know, the name change also indicates an additional service in estate planning that um, Marla's firm will be doing too, and she'll probably get into that a little bit better. But Marla is a partner and head of the firm's transactional department. She primarily practices in the areas of corporate, mergers and acquisition, real estate, finance, and employment law. Next, we have the famous Linda Duffy. She is the president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda works with a variety of different businesses and business owners to provide strategic human resources direction, develop leadership talent, and really help your organization get more effective and uh, with an eye towards that bottom line. So Linda's going to start us off today, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Linda, to tackle this complex web <laughs> of leaves of absences. Thanks so much, Julian. I don't know about your screen, but I cannot seem to get the slides to move. So maybe you could um, just take a look at that while I start talking. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. As Julie mentioned, we have just a ton of information. And having said that, ironically, you know, I think I looked it up the other day, and there's something like 23 different types of leads that an employee in California is potentially eligible for. Um, there's no way, obviously, we're going to be able to tackle all of those. And so we've really restricted it down to um, just a handful. And I'm hoping, Julie, we can move that slide forward so we can um, see our agenda. Um, so we're going to focus on some of the main ones that come up having to do uh, with medical leaves of absence. So for example, we're just going to talk about workers' comp leave real quickly. Thank you. Uh, pregnancy disability leave, fair employment and housing, uh, the ADA. And then Marla's going to talk about Family Medical Leave, California Family Rights Act. <laughs> She's also going to talk about engaging in the interactive process, which is a phrase that I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but it's sort of an important one when it comes to leave. And then she's also going to give us some examples of where employers go wrong and what some of the penalties are, because more and more we're seeing claims arise over um, someone's either failure to designate a leave properly, things like that. And then talk just a little bit about the best practices um, for the leave. Um, one of the things I always talk about with my clients, um, Julie, I don't know what happened, but I don't seem to have uh, control over this. And I'm looking at the list. I don't see the little arrow next to it. Okay. Let me just move these for you real quickly so we can keep Okay. Thanks. Um, so one of the things that I always uh, coach my clients on is that when you're thinking about leaves, and so I just want to start with this as an overall uh, comment. When we're talking about leaves, one of the things you want to do is separate the two issues between time off and pay. When, when someone comes to you and says, I need time off to take care of myself because I'm pregnant, to take care of my mother, or whatever the issue is, the, the first thing you need to do is just focus on whether or not they're entitled to any pay off. You know, what leave is it going to trigger? Um, how much time are they eligible for? That type of thing. And then a secondary issue is whether or not they may be able to be paid for that. Um, so there's different ways it might be paid. For example, your company might have a policy of, of paying all or some of you know, their regular salary when they're on a leave of absence or may have some sort of you know, benefit 
that would provide coverage uh, in terms of sick or vacation or PTO. There might be pay available from the state, like state disability insurance or uh, paid family leave or something like that. Or it could be from an insurance carrier. It could be like workers' comp coverage. So there's, there's a lot of different ways someone may get paid, but separate those two issues and it makes it a lot easier. So when we go through and we start talking about workers' comp, um, again, sorry about this. You guys are having a little bit of a technical problem. I can't move the slide forward, Julie. Um, so when we're talking about workers' comp, um, I'm starting all of our slides with what are the leaves that are going to apply across the board to pretty much everybody, and then going up to where it kicks in after uh, at 50 employees. And Marla's going to talk about this. So the first one is workers' comp leave. This is going to apply to everybody. If you have an employee, you are subject to workers' comp law. Um, and the thing to really know about workers' comp, and this is one slide on this, is if an employee comes to you and says, I have some sort of injury or illness that's related to work, what you need to do is immediately give them this workers' comp claim form, uh, DWC-1. Hopefully you have those already. Your workers' comp carrier or insurance broker will provide them to you. And just get the ball rolling on that. At that point, you know, again, you can work with your insurance carrier or broker to determine whether or not the employee is eligible you know, to take time off and whether or not they're going to be paid for it. Um, you want to make sure that you do that, though, so you don't end up getting a claim filed for failure to do that. And you also need to be careful uh, when it comes to workers' comp, because there's a section of the Labor Code, Section 132A, which some of you might have heard of before. Um, and it basically says that if you take action against that employee for, for using their rights under the law and, and uh, submitting a claim for a workers' comp claim, and, or you terminate them or something like that, it could be a discrimination claim against you under that section. Um, one of the things to note, and again, Marla's going to talk about FMLA and FIFA later, but one thing to note is that a lot of these leaves will run concurrent with one another. So it may trigger um, a leave for workers' comp, but at the same time, if it's a serious work injury or they're going to be out an extended period of time for their own serious you know, illness or injury, it may also trigger FMLA coverage. It may also tr trigger CFRA. And Marla will talk about why it, you might want to designate those uh, early on in the process so you can start the clock ticking against their um, available time. So on pregnancy, this is going to apply to employers that have five or more employees. So again, almost all of my clients, not all, I've got some that have just a couple of employees, but virtually all my clients, five or more employees. Um, there is no eligibility requirement for they're eligible to take paid uh, pregnancy disability leave. So just like workers' comp, from the minute they walk in the door, they're covered under, under that insurance. They're covered under, in this case, the pregnancy disability leave law. And so they don't have to, like they do under FMLA and other laws, have worked a certain number of hours or a certain number of months before they're eligible to take it. So you could have an employee that you hired walk in day one and say, hey, guess what? Wish me congratulations. I'm pregnant. That person's now got some protection under the law. Um, the other thing to note about pregnancy disability leave is that it can run concurrently with FMLA, meaning that you can start um, counting it against the 12 weeks under FMLA, but CFRA, because the pregnancy disability leave and CFRA are both California laws, CFRA actually carve pregnancy out separately. But, this is why, welcome to the great state of California, you could potentially have an employee that goes out on pregnancy disability leave, could exhaust FMLA, but then could come to you and say, I want to take up to 12 weeks to bond with my baby under CFRA. Okay, so that's why in California, you know, one time somebody like literally laid back to back all the different uh, leaves that a pregnant woman could potentially have and with vacation and sick and holiday was gone for virtually about a year. Uh, the next thing um, is qualifying reasons under the PDL. Um, disabled by pregnancy is the reason that somebody is eligible to take time off. I'll talk a little bit about that, but here's just some examples of of what may constitute a disability. So it may be even severe morning sickness or prenatal postnatal care. Sometimes if there's something going on that's pretty serious, the doctor may order bed rest. Once it gets to that point, the doctor should be the one that determines whether the employee is actually disabled or not. And that's what we're going to go with is disability. So under PDL, the maximum entitlement is four months. So you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, she's pregnant, she's going to take four months off. Well, that's not necessarily the case, because it's up to four months off due to pregnancy disability. 
Okay, so what that really means is for most normal pregnancies, most doctors will say it's four weeks before and six weeks after the baby's born. Now, she could potentially work up until the day the baby drops. It could be that she decides she wants to work through her ninth month. It could be that she wants to, or the baby comes early. There's a lot of reasons. It doesn't necessarily mean that she has any additional benefit. It's just while her doctor determines that she's disabled according to any of the reasons on that prior slide. So under the new laws that came out, or the revised or modifications law that came out last fall, um, I think uh, November, December, they're very specific now about how they calculate the four months. And it's one third of a year equaling 17 and a third a week. Um, so you can go ahead and, and figure out how they got there and do the math. But again, as I mentioned before, and that's I think 693 hours, but how the other thing to how um, they got there was just obviously taking the 40 hours per week. That's assuming somebody is working full time. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the thing on PDL to really focus on is the period of time for which the woman is disabled, not just she's going to you know, stay home and vomit her baby. Having said that, if you look at the second main bullet here on the bottom of this slide, as I mentioned, it exhausts FMLA but not CFRA. And so potentially a woman could take 17 and a third weeks under uh, pregnancy disability leave, and then turn around and ask for another 12 weeks off under CFRA to bomb with their baby. So could right there without any other leave be gone for 29 and a third week. Okay, uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to mention, sorry, I'm going to go back to slide. One other thing I wanted to mention about this is I talked before about separating time off and then also pay. Let's talk just a little bit about pay on pregnancy. So for most of the time, as soon as the doctor deems a woman disabled, the doctor's office is actually going to help her complete paperwork for state disability insurance. So it's going to provide her with a supplement for the period of time that she's disabled. Um, sometimes an employee wants to take sicker vacation. With this particular law, the employer can require her to utilize her sick pay, um, but cannot require her to use vacation or PTO. She can request it, you can approve it, but you can't require her uh, to use her vacation and PTO. So I just wanted to make sure uh, there was a little bit of clarity on that. Okay, intermittent leave, everybody's favorite. So intermittent leave means a situation where uh, an employee may come to you and say, you know what, I can't work full time, I have to take time off, or it could be you have to take time off to go to the doctor, but it could be I need to work a reduced schedule or you know, take time off on days when I have really serious morning sickness or anything like that. And you as an employer need to try to accommodate that request. And so one of the things they talk about is on the pay for intermittent leave, or the tracking of intermittent leave, I should say, um, the rule is that you can uh, allow them to take time. Um, it, it has to be, I want to make sure I say this right. So I have two examples, which actually is easier. So if the company allows employees to take sick or vacation in 30-minute increments, then you have to track intermittent leave in 30-minute increments. If the company says, no, you can only use you know, vacation, sick, or whatever, or other types of leave in eight-hour increments, the, most, um, you, the largest increment you can use to track intermittent leave is one hour. So that's what the law says. So it's, the, it's no greater than an hour, and it has to be the shortest time you use to track other leave. So hopefully I didn't, um, I was somewhat articulate on that, but this slide is going to help you uh, understand the difference between those two. Okay. Uh, medical certification, the doctor's going to say to you, hey, this employee, you know, has some sort of restricted duties. Like an example we were talking about before the webinar started, is let's say an employee comes to you and says, you know what, I can't be exposed to chemicals, I'm working as a player in a manufacturing company, can't work around the chemicals for the period of my pregnancy. And so request a transfer based on the doctor's note that says, you know, can't be exposed to chemicals, to another position. And what this slide is talking about is whether or not you have a requirement to transfer the employee to another position. You don't have a requirement. If you have another job available, then you should make that job available because that's going to be a reasonable accommodation. Um, let's say, though, the, the employee is making $12 an hour as a plater, and the only other job you have available for which they are qualified is an assembler job that pays less than that. So the question is, is you know, do you have an obligation to give them that job? Can you force them to take that job? Can you, you know, can you reduce their pay? And the answer is, you can provide that as an option for the employee. You can say, I've got this other opportunity for you. I don't have another job 
at the same rate of pay, um, but I do have this other opportunity as an assembler. I have no exposure to chemical. Would you like to take lead starting now, or would you like to take this assembly job? Now, that's one option for that. But let's say you have another job that pays the same amount of pay, and she is qualified to do that other duty. Um, you can force her to take the other position if it doesn't have any sort of reduction in uh, rate of pay or benefits. Okay? So if there is going to be a reduction, make it optional. Otherwise, you can go ahead and require her to take the other position. Um, as I said to Marla, I, you know, if it were me and I was advising my client and you know, she doesn't want to take $2 an hour pay or something like that, I'm probably going to just advise them, hey, just leave her at the same rate of pay just from an employee relations standpoint. It's going to go a lot farther. All right, notice for employee. Uh, employee has to you know, give you notice um, at least 30 days if possible. Usually with pregnancy, that's not an issue because most of the time women know they're pregnant before they have the baby, um, before the baby's born. So that one's a pretty easy one. You have a responsibility to respond uh, no later than 10 days after receiving the request. Um, and then you can make that retroactive to the first day of leave. So if the, you know, if the baby drops early, she was planning to go out, you know, you know, August 1st, but it happened this week, something like that, you can then move up the date and start counting the time. The other thing um, to know is that there's a new notice that has to be given, or as of last year, to employees. So it's one called Notice A, and that's for employers that have fewer than 50 employees, and then Notice B is 50 or more employees. And it basically just describes the employee's rights and responsibilities under the law. Um, so you want to make sure that you you just Google those, and if you literally just go and say California Pregnancy Notice A, it's really easy to find. They'll just pop up. All right. On the next one is certification. So, of course, we always advise that you're going to ask you know, for a doctor's note, medically certifying you know, what you know, if she's disabled or if she has restrictions of any sort of kind. Um, as long as the certification um, says that the, you know, that the employee needs to take PDL because she's disabled or due to a related medical condition, and the date on which she becomes disabled, that's enough to certify the leave right there. All right. And then the PDL, I think this is sort of duplicative of the earlier slide. Just make sure that if you're tracking intermittent leaves, it's no greater than the shortest period of time that you use for other leaves, um, and it can't be more than an hour. All right, reinstatement. This is the really uh, probably the hardest one for a lot of employers, especially if they just have a handful of employees. You know, if you're Coca-Cola and you have an employee who on a pregnancy disability, it's not pretty much probably a hardship to guarantee their right to return to the same position um, when they come back to work. And that's really what this law says, is a right to return to the same position. You have to hold that position open. If you're an employer, some of mine are that have 5, 10, 20, 50 employees, not so easy to hold that position open. Um, Honestly, with PDL, you know, you just have to sort of suck it up and figure out a way to do it for the most part. Um, I would really strongly urge you before you ever uh, do not put her back in the same position that you call Marla or another employment attorney and run it past, uh, past somebody else. There are some permissible defenses. So, for example, and I've had this happen before where we've had a layoff and we've ended up letting people go in the department and there was a woman that was out on pregnancy disability leave at the time. Well. You know, if the whole department goes, then that's great. What you would never want to do is say, oh, we're going to pick and choose people out of the department because we're going to, you know, reduce our number of headcount in that position by 20% and she's not here, so let's let her go. Don't ever do that. That's going to get you sued really easily. So if there's, um, you know, a layoff of legitimate business reasons, if the company goes out of business clearly, anything like that that has nothing to do with pregnancy, and that would be your burden to prove, um, then you could take that action, but otherwise, I would just say be really, really careful about it. Okay, so that's pregnancy. Um, there's a couple more slides that I want to get to Marla, so she has plenty of time and we have time for questions. Um, FEHA. Um, so Fair Employment Housing Act, uh, this again is five or more employees. We're giving you the government code section. This is not part of the labor code. Um, this is the one that dictates all of the different protected classes. Um, including disability, intellectual disability, and medical condition. So anytime somebody comes to you, they may not qualify under ADA or FMLA or anything like that, but if they have, if they have a medical condition, you have to take a look at FEHA to see if um, it's covered there. 
Uh, ADA and FEHA are very similar in a lot of different ways. There is one huge difference, which is the way they define uh, a disability. So in FEHA, it's a lot more generous for the employee. An impairment only has to limit a major life activity. And under ADA, it has to substantially limit. So again, good luck finding you know, definitions like that. Most of that's going to come out in case law and how the courts have interpreted it. Um, they might have some examples in the law, but it's pretty much going to be court-based at this point. Marla can talk to that if she wants to. You just want to be really careful. Um, they're very similar. Again, FEHA is going to be California. ADA is going to be federal. And this is where the employer has a permit duty to engage in what's referred to as interactive process to see whether or not there's a reasonable accommodation. Now, FEHA doesn't specifically grant leave. It's not like FMLA that says, oh, person can take off this much time, but courts have determined that a leave is a reasonable accommodation under FEHA. And so that's where the leave of absence comes in. So if you go read that, it, you know, read the statute, you're not going to find, you know, a specific, hey, the person can take off this much time. It's more about a reasonable accommodation under the law. Okay, disability, as I mentioned, 15 or more employees. And the employee is, again, eligible when you're disabled and cannot perform the essential uh, functions of the job, and that's just they cannot perform. Um, there is no set maximum length of time on this, like workers' comp, it doesn't say you can have up to 12 weeks or up to a specific period of time. The leave is, again, a reasonable accommodation under the law. And the other thing is that, that it can be used when employees already exhausted 12 weeks under FMLA or CFR for their own serious medical condition. So this is one of those times where people could just take one leave and then another leave and then another leave, and it gets <clears throat> pretty lengthy in time. Um, there's even been court cases, uh, one against Walmart, where the Ninth uh, Circuit held that a 10-month leave may be a reasonable accommodation. So again, talk to an attorney before you decide you don't want to continue to extend a leave for anybody because uh, you don't want to get in trouble with that. And then on the last slide for me, just on ADA, the request for the leave, the request, um, you know, when, once you get the request for leave of, a leave of absence under any of these, pretty much engage in interactive process. Marla's going to walk you through what that means. Um, I'm going to stop right there because I'm watching my time, Marla. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you because I know you're going to talk about FMLA and CFRA and talk about that interactive process, which is sort of the key to the last couple of leaves I just talked about. Thank you, Linda. I'm going to start by reviewing two of the easier, but by no means easy, um, statutes, then revisit two um, of the more difficult ones that Linda just touched on. So the first, the two that I'm going to start with is FMLA and CFRA. And what we've done with these slides is where the, uh, they're, they're substantially similar to start with, but where they're nearly identical, we put them on the same slide. And then where there are substantial differences or, or noted differences, we put them on separate slides. So first, looking at who, wh which employers are covered by FMLA and CFRA. Uh, of private entities, employers with 50 or more employees during 20 or more calendar work weeks, and that's not necessarily consecutive work weeks, um, in either the current or the preceding calendar year. Um, to be counted in the 50, the employee must have started at the beginning of the week and worked through the end of the week. For public entities, all public employers are covered regardless of the number of employees. Um, I do not engage in public employee law, so I don't touch on that much more than just that note right there. Uh, any full-time or part-time employee whose name appears on payroll in a calendar week is considered to be employed each working day of that week, whether or not she receives compensation. But again, that's to, to, to begin work on the first working day of the calendar week. Um, employees on any leave are counted as long as the employer has a reasonable expectation that the employee will later return to active employment. And this includes suspension, okay, vacation, uh, suspension, any, any type of leave, FMLA, uh, so once a part, back to the, um, the 20 or more calendar work weeks in the, in the calendar year, preceding calendar year counts as well. So by way of example, once a private employer meets the 50 employees 20 work week threshold, that employer remains covered until it reaches a future point where it no longer has employed 50 employees for 20 non-consecutive work weeks. And this is for both in the current and preceding calendar year. So this gets kind of dicey in trying to calculate. But by way of example, if an employer who met the 50 employee 20 work weeks test in the calendar year 2008 subsequently dropped below 50 employees for before the end of 2008 and continued to employ fewer than 50 
in all week, work weeks throughout the, the following year, which would be 2009, then the employer would continue to be covered throughout the calendar year 2009 because it met the coverage in 2008. So you can see it, it's, it's kind of a, a, a two-year look back or one-year look back. Hey, Marla, just before we move off this slide, just to be clear, when we're talking about public employers, we're not talking about if they're trade on the stock exchange. We're talking about government entity type employers. Correct. Right? Correct. Yes, cities, states, municipalities. I, I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. You're absolutely right. So next we're going to look at which employees are eligible under FMLA and CFRA. The employees must, the employee must have worked at least 1,250 hours in the 12 months preceding the start of leave. Those hours do not include vacation or PTO time. And they must work at the work site where the employer employs 50 or more employees within 75 miles of the work site. When you have joint employers, the primary employer's work site is where the employee reports or is assigned, and that's the work site that will be looked at for purposes of eligibility. They must be employed by the employer at least 12 months as of the date the leave commences. In joint employment situations, for example, where an employee is assigned by a temporary agency, the 12-month term of employment is determined from the date the joint employment begins. So when the temporary agency sends the employee out to the um, site of the employer. They must be employed by the employer for at least 12 months as of the date the leave commences. Uh, this means that you might be covered by FMLA as an employer, as we determined from the prior slide but you might have employees who are not eligible. You could have 30 employees in San Diego and 30 employees in San Francisco. So you're a covered employer because you've got 50. But you, um, your employees may not be eligible because no one work site or location has 50 employees within a 75-mile radius. So you're still obligated to post because you're a covered employer. You're posting obligations. Um, at each location, but you can deny the leaves, the FMLA leaves, to the employee once they request. Here's the difference in the two, FMLA and CFRA. The 12 months need not be consecutive if the employee has not had a break in service from employment for a period of seven years, uh, uh, for a period of service of seven or more years on the FMLA side. So for example, if I worked for, for um, three years and then took a break and then worked for another two years, I might still um, have worked at least 1,250 hours in, in the 12 months. I'd be OK. But, um, the CFRA does not have any similar provision. It does not impact the 12-month requirement. I have to apologize. An alarm just went off in my office, and I wasn't sure <laughs> which, which piece of technology was, was beeping. OK, so the next slide, the maximum allowed leave. Um, and and we here, we're, again, this is what I'm showing. We're just doing FMLA. I think you went on one too many. Um, we should be back on slide 22. The maximum allowed leave for FMLA is 12, 12 weeks and 12 month period. And at the employer's election, the employer can define what a leave year is. And there's four methods they can do so. Calendar year, which is what I often recommend for my clients just because it's the easiest. Fiscal year, or, or excuse me, any 12 month leave year, sometimes fiscal year, sometimes the anniversary year of the employee. 12 month, the third is the 12 month period measured forward from when leave is first taken or a fourth, a rolling 12-month period measured backward from when uh, the date the employee first chooses leave. You have to apply the chosen method of calculation consistently and uniformly to all employees, meaning you can't jump back and forth. You just pick one and you stick with it. And although the regulations do not expressly require the employer to provide written notice of the leave or your calculation method, we have at least one court that has said you must do so. So once you decide what that is, get it into your um, FMLA policy in your handbook, and that'll take care of that notice requirement. If you fail to select a calculation method, the courts will do it for you. <laughs> the most beneficial outcome for the employee is what they will use. Now, FMLA also has up to 26 work weeks for military caregiver leave to care for qualified military family member and qualified veteran. The eligibility period for this type of leave begins on the first day of military caregiver leave and runs for a single 12-month period. Uh, this is not in CFRA, only in FMLA. So the maximum leave allowed under CFRA is also 12 weeks and 12 month period. But unlike FMLA, CFRA does not allow for that 26, up to potential 26 weeks of leave for the care of a service member. 
CFRA leave does not need to be taken in one continuous period of time. If leave is common to both CFRA and FMLA, this 12-month period will run concurrently with the 12-month period under FLMLA. And this may be kind of confusing because you just heard Linda say earlier that a, an employee, a pregnant employee, could have FMLA and then PDL and then CFRA, and that doesn't sound concurrent. And that's true only in one instance, and that's when an employee has a pregnancy disability because FMLA covers a pregnancy disability and CFRA does not. They don't run concurrent. She could have FMLA leave, and then she would still be entitled to PDL leave, which, by the way, is not under CFRA. It's under FEHA, Fair Employment and Housing Act, which Linda also spoke to and we'll speak to some more. But that's why it's the only instance that I'm aware of that where you can have that, and that would be the only time it doesn't run concurrent. So if the leave is for serious health condition, then it's going to be concurrent between CFRA and FMLA, and it's not going to tack on, as, as in Linda's example. Um, CFRA places limits on leaves for the birth, adoption, or foster care placement of a child. The duration leaves taken because of birth, adoption, or foster care placement of a child must be concluded within one year of placement, same as FMLA. That's not the difference. The difference is the nonconforming provisions. Unlike FMLA, under uh, CFRA, the minimum duration of such leave generally is two weeks, and except that the employee has a right to two times taking shorter leave, also known as intermittent leave. The differences don't really matter much because you must give the employee whichever is more beneficial. So I always tend, when I'm, I'm dealing with these very complex, as we use the term web, because everything ties in together, and um, by no means is simple, even for attorneys who deal with this on a daily basis, I always run back to the question, why? Why do we have this federal law and then a state law that was adopted to be substantially similar? And all I can tell you is I don't know. I have I've searched and searched to, to try and find the answer to that question, other than I know that, that California does give more leave, as we just showed by way of our example of the the um, pregnancy disability that could take care of all three. Why did the legislatures didn't just adopt additional to add on to the federal? Uh, I can't explain that. If I could explain what the California legislature does, I'd probably be in politics myself. <laughs> so qualifying reasons. What qualifies you for the lead? Um, under both of them, serious health condition of the employee, this is an absolute right. If, you, if the employee meets the requirements for leave, the leave must be granted. There's no business necessity or undue hardship defense here like there is under FEHA and ADA. Um, however, we'll talk later about under certain circumstances, you can refuse to reinstate a key employee who has taken FMLA. Again, pregnancy is excluded under CFRA, but not under FMLA as we just talked about. Uh, another qualifying reason is the serious health condition of a child, spouse, or parent birth of a child and care for the child, call that baby bonding, placement of a child with the employee for adoption or foster care. I think what's notable here is under both of them, um, when you're talking about placement, it's even meeting with lawyers and counselors to prepare for that placement. And then military family leave, again, that's um, for FMLA only. Uh, and this was adopted in, in 2008 and then again amended in 2010 and keeps getting expanded. And I, I recognize that many of you may not have had to deal with this before. However, we do have, depending on who you listen to, a million or more servicemen and women coming home in the next year or two. And I think we are going to see more and more of this. And it includes attending certain military events, arranging for alternative child care, addressing certain financial and legal arrangements, attending certain counseling sessions, and, and attending post-deployment reintegration briefings. So it's a very expanded type of leave. Um, and the definition, it also includes not just covered service members, but also veterans. Uh, a, a, the definition of a covered veteran is an individual who is discharged or released under conditions other than dishonorable discharge any time during the five-year period prior to the first date that an employee takes leave to care for the covered veteran. So it's a long period of time. And, and the definition for serious injury or illness for service members and veterans is, is expanded. It's beyond um, just, just the regular FMLA um, definitions. You'd have to look at it each time. So 
notice requirements by the employee to take advantage of, of their, their rights under either of these statutes. The, the employee must notify the employer for the need uh, for the qualifying leave. Where the leave is needed due to a serious health condition, the employer can also require a medical certification. The notice can be verbal or written and may be given by the employee or if the employee is unable to give notice by their spokesperson. Um, an employee must also tell the employer what the anticipated timing and duration of the leave will be if they can. Um, again, it's very similar to the, the other statutes, 30 days if foreseeable or as soon as practical, practicable if unforeseeable. And that's generally in the real world, as Linda likes to use the term, what we see. Uh, um, other than with pregnancy, that's usually foreseeable and we get those notices uh, 30 days, sometimes even more. But with everything else, it just seems to be um, as soon as practical, practicable. Um, the notice must be sufficient to let the employer know that the leave is for an FMLA qualified reason, although the employee need not expressly mention FML rights. Now, there's two schools of thought here. Some uh, attorneys will say, oh, well, then you don't need, if you don't know that it's for FMLA, you don't need to do anything about it. I want to get the ball rolling. I want to get the time ticking, or as some of you have put in your questions, tracking. I have immediately, upon thinking that someone has availability of FMLA or CFRA, want to send them notice that the that they are, they may be eligible for those leaves, and here's a questionnaire, and are you applying for them, and ask them, and then start that timing and say that you're being granted this leave. Even if they're on workers' comp leave, as Linda discussed, then you can get the FMLA, CFRA slash 12 weeks out, out of the way, because many times, as you all know, those workers' comp leaves go on forever and ever and ever. I've had um, workers' comp cases open for eight, nine, ten years. We don't practice in that area, but we track them most often because there's a 132A, as Linda mentioned, going on at the same time. Um, for intermittent or reduced leave schedules, only a single notice is required, except if there's a change, then the employer must also the employee must also invite the employer. So um, a, a denial of leave where reasons unexplained, you, an employer can deny the leave. When the employee gives notice but fails to respond to inquiries, then they have to be reasonable inquiries um, so that you can't determine whether it falls under FMLA or not. So then notice requirements by employer. These notice requirements arise other than the posting requirement after you've been given notice by the employee. You have to notify the employee whether the leave will be designated as FMLA leave within five days and 10 days if it's CFRA. So except for the one example I gave you where it's not concurrent, you're going to be doing five. Whenever there is a, a difference in the two laws, remember I just have stated earlier, you always go with the law that is most favorable to the employee, of course, not the employer. The designated, designation notice must contain notice of whether the absence is designated as FMLA qualified or if it's the CFRS, CFRS number of hours, days, or weeks that will be counted against employees' leaves entitlement if known. If the leave duration is unforeseeable, the employer may request this information once every 30 days throughout the leave. Whether the employer requires paid leave to be substituted for unpaid FMLA leave or to be counted as FMLA leave, we'll talk about that in a minute. And whether the employer will require employees to prevent a fitness for duty certification in order to be restored to the same job. And if so, a list of the job's essential functions. And we'll talk about that in a minute, why that's important. I, as a matter of course, always require a, a, a doctor's note that they can come back just to make sure that the employee is not possibly going to hurt themselves and have also an additional worker's comp claim or someone else if they're unable to perform a job that, that may affect another employee. So intermittent leave is taken in separate blocks of time due to a single qualifying reason, but it, it, is, it is allowed. And the reduced leave schedule is a change in employee schedule for a period of time. For example, from full-time to part-time. You must grant either when medically necessary, and that includes to care for a spouse, child, or parent of the employee with serious health condition. And there are definitions for all of these that make these uh, statutes even more complex and make the web even more difficult to, to navigate. Um, I mean, there's definitions of what a parent is. And, and so you have to look at each one of those. Um, Again, medically necessary includes employees' own serious health condition and to care for a covered service member. I, this slide, again, is only for FMLA. And the employer may require the employee to transfer temporarily to an alternative position in certain circumstances, FMLA only. 
and let me just point out here, um, unlike medically necessary leaves under FMLA, some intermittent or reduced schedule leaves require an employer's consent that for to care for a newborn child or to care for the employee's newly placed adopted child. That's not true um, on C, um, CFRA. So you're here in California, CFRA is going to control. Look at CFRA intermittent leave. It's very similar, except it allows the employee request for intermittent or reduced scheduled leaves because of the birth, adoption, or foster care of a child without employer's consent. So under FMLA, you need the employer's consent for the intermittent. Under CFRA, which if you're in California is going to apply, you don't. Um, it also does not provide for a temporary transfer of an employee to an alternative position. And the request is for an intermittent or reduced work schedule for child care. Um, the minimum duration of a leave taken for birth adoption or foster care placement of a child in California is generally two weeks. However, the employer must grant a request at least two times um, for intermittent leave for less than two weeks. Again, whichever is more beneficial for the employee, you have to follow. So Linda talked briefly about substituting paid leave, and I'm going to be brief about it as well. And one of the reasons is it is secondary, and you have to first go through this, as you can see, very complicated analysis of what applies and if leave is available at all before you get into anything about uh, the substituting leave. Under FMLA, the employee may substitute accrued vacation, paid vacation, personal, medical, sick leave for an FML leave for an employee's own serious health condition. The employee may substitute accrued paid vacation for personal or family leave for unpaid FMLA leave to care for a child, spouse, or parent with a serious health condition. And the employee may also substitute paid leave for unpaid FMLA for the birth of a child. Those are all the employee may, the employee may. The trick here is if the employee does not elect to substitute accrued paid leave for FMLA leave, the employer may require the employee to use such paid leave. So under FMLA, the employee, employer may require the employee to substitute those um, paid leaves for the unpaid leave that the employer must notify the employee within five days. However, there's some slight differences under CFRA. Whether the employer may require, which is what most employers want to do, um, the substitution of paid sick leave for um, CFRA depends on the reason for the leave. So if the, if the employee's own serious health condition is the reason for the leave, then the employer may require the employee to use any accrued sick leave during a leave for the employee's own serious health condition. You cannot, as an employer, require the employee to use sick leave for the birth of a child, the adoption or foster care placement, or the care for a child's spouse parent with a serious health condition. So it, I'm speaking very quickly because we don't have a lot of time, but hopefully you are noting, oh my gosh, this is so confusing, which one applies, which one doesn't. Um, and, and then after you determine which one applies, then what can I do on the paid leave? That should always be the secondary. Um, unlike FMLA, CFRA makes it clear that if the employee asks to use accrued vacation or other accrued time off, except the sick leave, um, without mentioning a CFR qualifying reason, the employer cannot ask whether the employee is taking time off for a CFR a qualifying purpose. However, if the employer denies the request pursuant to its regular policies, for example, the vacation comes in an inconvenient time or the employee provides insufficient notice, and the employee then invokes the FRA rights in order to take leave, then the employer may inquire further into the need for absence. So for example, if I come to my employer and say, I want to take two weeks off um, and I'd like to use my vacation time, and the employer says, I'm sorry, this is not a good time for vacation, it's our busy season, you'll have to schedule it for another time, um, the employer can't at that time say, well, why do you want to take the two weeks off? But if the employee says, well, I need to take the time off um, to um, take care of a serious health condition, I've got chronic sinus infection and I'm going to need to have surgery, then the employer may inquire further and, and, and designate and send out the necessary notices. Just to touch one, uh, briefly once again on the medical cer certification under both of them, you may require medical certification for an employee taking family leave for his or her own serious illness or to care for a family member, but baby bonding doesn't count. Under FMLA, if you, it, if you require medical certification, the employer should give the employee written notice within five business days after the employee's need, notice of need for FMLA leave 
or if the leave was unforeseeable within five days after it has begun. There's no similar requirement or, or CFRA, which means you fall back and you must do this under FMLA. Um, a common mistake employers make is, is not knowing the difference between serious health condition and common ailment. A uh, serious health condition is defined under both of them as an illness, injury, impairment, or physical or mental condition that involves inpatient care in a hospital or residential um, medical care facility or continuing treatment by a health care provider. Unlike FMLA, under CFRA, disclosure of a specific serious health condition of an employer or family member may not be required. So reinstatement under both of them. An employer must reinstate the employee to the same or an equivalent job with equivalent pay, benefits, and other terms and conditions of, of employment under both of them. Uh, however, uh, excuse me, uh, um, equivalent pay means the same pay as before the leave plus any unconditional pay increases, which the employee would have received during the leave period. So if the employee is on a, a, a an automatic salary uh, increase because of seniority, let's say, or tenure, and if that increase occurs, then that reinstatement must happen with the increase. If the employee is not reinstated to the position held prior to the leave, must be given a position with substantially similar duties, conditions, responsibilities, privileges, and status of the, as of the employee's original position. So unlike the uh, uh, PDL here, it's not the same position, it's same or an equivalent. So we always use the term substantially similar because that's straight out of the statute. The limitation is the employee is not entitled to reinstatement if unable to perform an essential function of the position because of the physical or mental condition, including the continuation of serious health condition. The burden is on the employer to justify refusal to reinstate. However, this is my big however, under FMLA and CFRA, reinstatement is not required due to the necessity of an accommodation. But then the ADA and um, Fair Employment and Housing Act, FEHA, would kick in. And then in those cases, the employer's obligations would be governed under those acts, and the analysis under those acts must be done. It's wholly distinct. I want to give you the key, the definition of a key employee that I spoke about earlier is a salaried employee who is one of the highest paid 10% of all employees within the 75 miles of the employer's work site. And if that type of employee is, is, is not in reinstatement, or excuse me, reinstatement would result in substantial and grievous economic injury to the employer, the employer can deny reinstatement. The problem is defining substantial and grievous uh, economic injury. It, 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 becomes a question of fact, and that means you've got a claim, and now it's up to a judge or a jury to decide. So the interactive process. I, I would like to point out, I know the time is getting away, and we might not get to questions, but we could spend days, not just an hour webinar, on the interactive process. The interactive process is required. I'm moved off of um, FMLA and CFRA. And this applies to FEHA and the ADA. It, it, both of them require an interactive compre, uh, process. Um, it, this is a very difficult area, um, but we have gotten a little bit of uh, direction from our recent regulations um, from FEHA. But let's look at first the, the what happens when, to trigger the necessity of the interactive process, when the employer must initiate the process. Three things. The employer is made aware of the need for accommodation by a third party or by observation, and that includes um, perceived disabilities. that The employee may not have a disability, but the employer may perceive that the employee does. The second, the employee specifically requests accommodation. I can't hear, and I'm answering the phones. I need an accommodation. That was one of the earliest examples um, that came out with the cases. The third, employee uh, with a disability exhausts leave under workers' comp or um, CFRA or FMLA. And, and we know that there's accommodation necessary there. The interactive process, let me give you the definition of the interactive process that just came out in the new regs. It's the timely good faith communication between the employer or other covered entity and the applicant or employee. Remember that a FIHA and ADA apply to both applicants and employees or when necessary, because of disability or other uh, um, circumstances, 
his or her representative to explore whether or not the applicant or employee needs reasonable accommodation for that applicant or employee's disability to perform the essential functions of the job. And if so, how the person can be reasonably accommodated. So what is it? it it's a dialogue. It's a dialogue back and forth to determine do you, we've already determined that there's either a disability or perceived disability. So now we're determining, do you need reasonable accommodation? Maybe you don't. Maybe you have a disability that's common to a lot of people, diabetes, and you don't need, you, you've you got it under control. You don't need any, any accommodation. But maybe the process is going to determine whether there is a need. And then if there is a need, how the person can be reasonably accommodated. I will tell you that this area is exploding with lawsuits, and the reason is, is several fold, but primarily twofold. Under FEHA, the definition of disability is so broad, as Linda pointed out earlier. It is so broad that it just must simply um, affect a major life activity. And plaintiff lawyers love to put in front of judges and juries things that can be defined in several ways. Let me tell you how to define that. The other is, what is reasonable? I think we've pointed out earlier, what's reasonable for Coca-Cola is not necessarily reasonable for somebody else who has six or seven employees. Um, there are several factors you have to look at, but because it's not defined, it doesn't say five or more, you have an argument. You always have an argument. And wherever there's an argument, the plaintiff's lawyers love to bring claims because they know if I can make the argument, I'm gonna, you're going to incur the cost to counter-argue or in the litigation field defense. Um, there, there are defenses to accommodations and that's undue hardship. That is another term that doesn't have definition. Uh, what is undue hardship? There is definition in the regs that, of what we will look at. We will look at you know, the financial position of the employer, the type of position the employee was making. But I'm, I'm trying to raise your awareness of how difficult this process is. And you should really seek the assistance of uh, an attorney or a, an experienced HR consultant in this area and, and then understand that you may get from them, I can't tell you with certainty you're not going to see a claim. We can only assess the risk of that claim and address how we can lower the risk of that claim by doing some other things. Let's grant the um, accommodation, let's offer this accommodation, let's offer different positions. There's a lot of things we can do to reduce the risk. Um, and during the interactive process, you can seek additional examination. You can ask for medical documentation, not about the underlying cause, not about the underlying medical issue, but about the limitations, the need, the, the need for accommodation. I can't remember if I, I discussed who should participate in the process, but certainly it should be whoever is in charge of HR, HR director, sometimes it's the controller, owner of the company, depending on the size of the company, the employee, obviously, and then the employee representative to the extent they have one, uh, um, the doctors can get involved, again, without providing information about the underlying cause, but definitely about the limitations or needs. Okay, where employers go wrong. Uh, first is you know, fail, failing, failing to provide a leave when there's one clearly um, available under FMLA or CFRA. And that's why I said those two, while not easy or simple, are easier and simpler than the others because it, it doesn't require the interactive process. You just go through the analysis and the statute of whether leave is available. The failure to designate time off as a leave. Um, you, you have, that, that really hurts you as the employer, not the employee, because until you designate, that leave is always available if they're eligible. Retaliation, uh, taking an, an employment action, whether it's um, termination, suspension, demotion, uh, assigning bad schedule, schedules because somebody was off on leave. Uh, most people know they're not supposed to do that. Some employers still do it. Failure to engage in the interactive process, huge mistake, uh, but understanding that the interactive process is time time consuming, um, difficult, uh, it, it's still important. Failure to properly document the leave, I, I would say that kind of ties in with designation. You've got to give those notices that are required under the statute. And there's tip and privacy um, issues as well that where employers go wrong, they release information that they should not release regarding um, the underlying cause that sometimes comes out, doesn't have to, but sometimes does, and they fail to take the necessary steps to keep it confidential, or sometimes worse, run around the office saying, oh my God, did you know Susie's pregnant? Oh my God, did you know Bob has diabetes? So when you're assessing, what, uh, when you're assessing an accommodation, the new regs require that you analyze the essential job functions of the job. 
So make sure for all your jobs you have that. And the essential job functions are defined in the new regs as the mean, uh, as, excuse me, are defined in the new regs as the fundamental job duty. So I'm making a strong case, Linda and I have some arguments over this, for job descriptions or at least a, a, a title document that says fundamental job duty because the new regs require it. And the new regs can be found on the FEHA website. So lastly, um, leave of absence best practices. I just want to start the, or end by saying something Linda started with. We're, we've only covered the biggest. Um, there are so many others. There's alcohol and drug leaves, victims of crimes leaves, witness duty leaves, jury duty leaves, school visit leaves. Hopefully we will cover those smaller ones all in, in, a, in, in a webinar um, in the upcoming months. So for your best practices, your, hopefully your takeaways, ensure you provide proper notices to employees, both the pamphlets that are required on hire, posters, postings. Analyze requested to determine which leave laws apply. There is a fantastic chart on the Fee House website uh, titled Comparison Between New Family and Medical Leave Act and California Family Rights Act. Excellent place to start. Um, it, it's not necessarily the place to end. If you're not sure, pick up the phone and call an experienced uh, HR consultant or attorney. Make sure you have documents to determine right to leave and properly designate leave. There are excellent um, forms. We've created, and, and I've seen some online as well, that, to send out to the employees and say, here's what, the, what you may be eligible for. Complete this checklist, this questionnaire, and let's see what you are eligible, and then we'll designate. Um, engage in the interactive process. Don't skip it. <laughs> That's a best practice. If you're required under the ADA or the uh, uh, FIHA, engage in it. If you're not sure how to engage in it, pick up the phone and call someone. And again, that I you know I've said it 10 or 12 times now, call the attorney or an experienced consultant to help you. And by that, I'm two minutes away from ending. <laughs> well, ladies, uh, we just want to thank you very much. We know this is a very complex uh, area. And um, apologize to all of you that we ran a little long. So, um, But what I did was able to do is talk to both Marla and Linda and ask them to be available for questions. So again, if you've got the handout, you know that they are um, their all of their uh, bios and contact information are available for you to contact them directly. I've got Linda's up right now. So again, this is in the handouts. If you didn't receive the handout, feel free to email me again at julie at enlightenbiz.com. And then again, this is Marla's uh, email addresses are right there. Again, um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And on behalf of Linda Duffy with Ethos Human Capital Solutions. And Marla Mira Robinson with Mira Robinson, Jackson, and Clarkson. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us. We will be looking at a webinar similar to this um, and welcome your feedback at any point in time. So feel free to either contact Linda, Marla, or complete a survey we'll be sending you shortly to, to also ask you about topics. Speaking of the next uh, webinar, we'll be doing one on performance appraisals, probably another meaty uh, topic for everybody to cover. Um, please mark your calendars for August 22nd at 11 a.m. and we'll be sending more information on how to register for that at a later date. Um, Julie, if I could just interrupt for just absolutely. a minute. Absolutely. Um, performance evaluations is a fun topic. Unlike this very difficult, convoluted, um, stressful co topic we did today, and that's true for even the lawyer to practice in this area <laughs> and the HR consultants like Linda, we pull our hair out with, the, with these because the statutes are so broad and undefined. Um, performance appraisals and performance evaluation discussions are really fun because there are a lot of different ways you can do it and um, a lot of different schools of thought on it and uh, they're not required by law. They're just something that helps the employers in their defense. So I, I'm looking forward to next month and I hope everybody will join us. Great. And Linda, do you have any parting comments or anything? Uh, no, I think that's okay. it. All right. Well, again, thank you all for joining us. And we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much.